Hey guys, welcome to WOW, Word on Wheels. Thank you so much for joining in this morning. And uh, again, I say it repetitively, but if you can pass this around, uh, I, I believe it'll help a lot of people because you all know people that I don't and uh, just connect them with the word. And I wanna say I do notice uh, when you guys chime in and I certainly appreciate that. Uh, and a lot of times I, I can see people chiming in, but I, uh, I don't respond at that moment because I'm focused on the message, but I do go back and read your responses. So uh, give me your thoughts. Uh, let me know where you're listening from. Give me your thoughts. And uh, I would certainly appreciate that. I do want to say to my Oklahoma friends, I was scheduled to be with Pastor Dale Litzy in Oak Mulgee, uh, Oklahoma, this morning. And uh, let's see, last Tuesday, I was made aware a uh, very dear friend of mine, more like a brother, uh, Pastor Keith Stewart in Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, I have known Keith. I met Keith in 1976, so 45 years. And we have traveled to Africa. We traveled many places and ministered, and, and we just enjoy hanging out together. I had received a phone call that Keith had passed away and uh, his wife I've I've known uh, for 40 years and so uh, she got a hold of me and asked me if I would do the memorial service on Monday and of course their associate pastor has uh, the COVID and so uh, I am filling in this morning at this church and Pastor Dale in Oak Mulgee was so gracious. Even though he had already advertised it, he totally understood. So we will reschedule that date, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. You have to do what you have to do. And it was the right thing to do. And yes, it was last minute. Uh, not death is never on a calendar. And so, uh, anyway, that's the reason I'm having to come to you at eight o'clock this morning because I'm on East Coast time. And I have a service that starts at 10 o'clock, nine o'clock central time. So I will make this brief, but I was having some thoughts last week. Uh, I know maybe you're still processing it, but if you'll listen to last week's message, it just makes sense, you know? Uh, the Bible says to give hilariously. Now, that's not just money. It's also in the context. We are supposed to give of ourselves, give of our time, give of our resources, give of our talents. Just help people. We're Christian. Uh, and being a Christian doesn't mean you live by a set of rules. It means one thing you walk in love. Why? Because God is love. And the word Christ means to be anointed. So you are anointed to walk in love. And my question that came to my mind was, you're being good to people, but are you doing it hilariously? Or is that person wearing you out, stressing you out, and frustrating you? So I wanna go a little farther into what I was teaching last week. And again, I pray that you get a hold of this because it will absolutely liberate your life. Uh, I used the context of 2 Timothy, the first, or the third chapter, the second through the fifth verse, but what I want to focus on today is the fifth verse. Again, totally in context, when the Apostle Paul told Timothy, there are people that have a form of godliness, but they don't walk in the power of love. 
And then he makes this statement, from those people turn away. Now, again, I don't know if you've ever heard a minister say, there's some people you just don't need to mess with. Well, Mark, I'm supposed to win everybody. No, God's got other people that can get into their lives. Uh, when you reach the point you get frustrated, stressed, you dread seeing them come, you dread them ringing your phone, you have reached that point that you are now in the way. I'm not saying don't take their call. I'm not saying uh, just not even talk to them anymore. What I am saying is quit trying to please the insatiable. When you reach that point in your life, you will be more free than you ever have been. And I'm talking about relatives, I'm talking about friends, I'm talking about co-workers. You have to reach a place where when you are good to people, you can do it hilariously, not begrudgingly. If your goodness to somebody is begrudgingly as the Apostle Paul was talking about, then you're not helping them and you're not helping you. You are being stolen from. And I don't mean just money. I mean your peace, your happiness, your joy, your very life. There are personalities that will ruin your life. And I talked about those four last week. I may teach an in-depth series on this uh, later. But what I want to deal with today is selfishness. Because selfishness, if you want to push my button, act selfish. Even in traffic, it is absolutely amazing. I remember uh, years ago, you put on a blinker in traffic and people would back off and let you in. Now, you put on a blinker and it's a call to war because everyone puts them, not all, but most people will put themselves in front of you, okay? their needs in front of you. Selfishness, and I love to study this psychologically, and I do have to hurry. Selfishness is simply, it's just being overly concerned, even excessively and exclusively for yourself. What's to your advantage? What's to your welfare? Regardless of other people's needs. Here's the key. When you're dealing with a selfish person, it is proven in psychology that the most insecure people are always the most selfish people. If, you, In other words, if they don't get taken care of by others, and because you're just, you keep on trying to please them, you keep on trying to please them, they have to make sure their needs are met before anyone else has their needs met. So going by the literal definition of selfishness, a selfish person is the one who puts their own needs first. They're primarily concerned with themselves and they only seek things that would fill their own desires and their wants. But here I have to ask, is there really anything wrong with that? Not totally, because in some sense, we are all selfish in one way or another. All of us want to do things that are ultimately for our own good and our well-being. That type of selfishness is good. It's even desirable. But the problem happens when we do things for ourselves and at the same time, ignore the needs of other people around us. Or when we fulfill our needs at the expense of others. See, when you make life difficult for others to meet your needs, that kind of selfishness is the selfishness you need to, as Paul said, turn from those people. Okay, now understand, selfishness, selfishness and selflessness are two psychological drives. We all have those 
drives in our psyche, in our thoughts, in our brain. We have a drive that says, I've got to be selfish. I need my needs met. I don't care what you need. I need my needs met. And those kind of people will wear you out and ultimately shorten your earthly life. So selflessness is in you also, but you have to choose every day. You can be a selfless person or you can be a selfish person. Selfishness to the degree I've got to take care of my body. I've got to take care of my mind. That's okay. But selfishness of I want this, I want this, and I'm not going to be happy until I get that. You can only feed that so long. And, and I'll be very straight up with you. You are feeding your own demise if you continue to try to please someone that is insatiable. Sometimes you just have to get out of the way and let the guilt go. I've seen too many pastors try to please a church, please a church, please a congregation, and they ended up dying because they couldn't please everybody. I think I'm old enough now. I went through those years trying to please everybody. I, I, did, I am a selfless person, but I am in balance, I believe, of selfishness also. God made us that way because we are a free moral agent. You can choose how far you go with selfishness. You can choose it. It's normal and healthy to look out for yourself, but it's abnormal to not look out for others in need. And if I'm talking to you and you're realizing, oh my God, I've been selfish. Why are you mad at that person? Because they didn't do what you wanted them to do? And I don't mean your kids. I am a firm believer in discipline of your children. And I think if a lot more people would do that in a constructive way, and a determined way, and a very disciplined way, we wouldn't have a lot of grandparents raising their grandchildren. But anyway, that's another story. But see, you can become lopsided because in our psyche, we do have a selfish side and we have a selfless side, but you can become lopsided. Uh, when you are lopsided, to the selfless side, you ignore yourself and your needs, and in turn, it affects your enjoyment of even living life. So you can be too selfless. Is helping someone wearing you out, then you're lopsided. Remember, the crux of this teaching is if you can't do things hilariously with joy, then you are doing it begrudgingly. And that, ma'am, is killing you. Sir, it's wearing you out. There must be a balance. Now, there's a few characteristics of lopsided selfishness. When a person is too selfish, they're stingy because in their mind they're thinking, well, if I do that, I won't have enough if I help someone else. And the reason people are overly selfish is even in traffic is because they fear the loss of control. They fear the loss of control of even reaching their goal that they desire because they think if they lose their resources, they lose their goals, and if they lose their goals, they lose their life. So there is no greater love that a man would have for his friend than he would lay down his life. See, that's selflessness. But it didn't say no greater love when you give up your life. Laying down your life means, hey, I could use those resources for my goals, 
but I'm going to do this hilariously and I'm going to help this person. Now, if this person comes back and, and has another need and they get mad at you because you didn't meet at that time, turn from those people. We are too slow in understanding who the enemy has sent to drain you of life itself. The most important thing to do, according to psychology, when you're dealing with a selfish, selfish person is to figure out the reason behind their selfishness and then try to eliminate that reason. Try to let them know, hey, you don't have to be stingy. God said you give and it'll be given back to you a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. Okay. But if they don't get that, turn from those people. Give them time. Well, how much time do I give them? Till you start getting frustrated, till you start getting stressed. How long is it going to take you to get stressed out? That's how long that battle is going to last. Okay? God, I hope you all are getting this. Do you remember in the Old Testament the story where the prophet Elijah was called up? I think it was in 1 Kings 17, and it continues into 1 Kings chapter 18, the first few verses. Uh, the drought was there, and Elijah was being fed by the raven at the brook Cherith. And God told him, get up from here because the brook had dried up. Get up from here and go to Zarephath. I've got a widow woman there that needs you. And so when Elijah showed up, he asked the woman, uh, would you give me a little water? She said, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. And while she was walking away, he said, oh, and make me a little cake also. She wheeled right around. Now, watch this. Here is a woman that is out of balance. So the word came to bring her into balance. You will never tap prosperity until you understand balance. Some of you have worked all your lives to gather your resources so that you can live comfortably and you're letting people drain you. Now you're having to look for a part-time job. You're having to look for things. Let me tell you something. If what you're giving is not coming back to you, you are sowing in soil that is not fertile. Okay? And so, you know, what did she do? She, she said, I don't have enough meal to make you a cake. I only have enough for me and my son. See, they're stingy. But there's also the loss of control. I can't control when I die if I do this. Because she said, I only have enough for me and my son a cake, and we're going to eat it, and then we're going to die. Because there was a famine going on. They had no more. He said, well, make me a cake first. And so what he was doing was he was letting her know, I'm giving you an opportunity for balanced living by asking you to tap your selflessness. So he came to a selfish person because when a need arises in our lives, there is a tendency that the selfish side begins to want to take over. See, Understand this, and Lord of mercy, I have to hurry. When a miracle is about to happen in your life, God will most always bring you to balance before that blessing occurs. Okay? Now, and now you may be wondering, Mark, ooh, I'm not even asking, just am I selfish? Am I in balance? You're selfish to take care of you, but you're selfless to take care of others. So you're both being taken care of. But if others are draining you, then you're out of balance.
if they're draining your energy, your drive, your want to, if you're praying, God, just take me home, you are feeding someone that doesn't want to change. Because if they don't mooch you, they'll mooch someone else. They're just going to wait until they tap you out and then go tap somebody else on the shoulder. But here's a few signs that you're dealing with a selfish person. They'll nag you and they'll even belittle you if you don't meet their needs. These people always think what they have to do is more important than what you have to do. These type of personalities, and, and hear me, I said it last week, a human is not your enemy. It's the mindset they operate in that is the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You are not a martyr. Living the crucified life doesn't mean you've got to be crucified by somebody. That's not even what that scripture means. Holy smokes. These type of personalities, the people that walk in these personalities are usually very competitive. And they're insecure. And these type of people, they don't even apologize even when they know they're wrong. Those are the four signs of a selfish person according to modern day psychology. That's not Mark Shell's opinion. So, Mark, how do I deal with the selfishness in other people? Stay true to yourself. Don't stoop to their level. If their needs are straining you, if their needs are just draining you of all your energy, not only your resources, but they're not wanting to ch Okay, I'm sorry about that. My uh, phone was in the sunlight. Thank God it's warm in New England. The first time I came up here at this church was in f January of 1998. Just a Sunday to Wednesday. Oh, Everything broke out, power of God moved. I stayed here five months. So I've been coming to this congregation 23 years. I love New England. Ooh, it's cold in the winter. But these people will drain you, absolutely drain you. So you've got to stay true to yourself. You know your resources. You know your limits. And some of you have not built boundaries you have not built boundaries and you just let people run over you. It's not that person, it's that personality the enemy is using to steal, kill, and destroy you. When are you going to start? Here's another way to deal with selfish people. Starve them of the attention they're craving from you. Starve them of that attention they crave from you. Stop feeding their insecurity by doing favors for them. Stop feeding that insecurity. You're not feeding a person. You're feeding a personality. Oh my Lord, sir, please quit that. There's too much fertile soil out there for you to be sowing seed into something that doesn't want to change yet. Let someone else, God's got, God cares about these people. Let someone else that God's got in mind that that person will adhere to and listen to, let them be the one that God uses to bring the change about. Listen to last week's message and you'll understand that. God never gives up on a person. Don't get me wrong. But some of you, need to get out of God's way and stop being an idol worshiper. Yeah, I said it.
See, the word says, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 24th verse says, we should stop looking out for our own interest and instead focus on the people living and breathing around us. Okay? So if you're dealing with somebody that does not adhere to that, turn from them. You know, many of you, uh, are of the mind, well, I just don't hang around people that smoke dope. I don't hang around people that drink. I don't hang around couples that just live together and they're not married. You know, and you have your own convictions. You have your own values. But can I tell you something this about this? He's saying don't hang around people that are draining your in energy. That is as much a command of God. Why, Mark? Because how can you walk in love when you dread showing it? Proverbs, the 18th chapter, the first verse says, whoever pulls away from others to focus solely on their own desires disregards any sense of sound judgment. And again, I'm not telling you don't witness to people. I just know I want you to know when your witness has expired, someone else will come in and God will use them. God's not going to give up on a person, okay? See, Jesus even disregarded the Father, rather, even disregarded the prayer of that self-righteous Pharisee. You remember the one that beat on his chest and said, I've paid my tithe, I go to the synagogue, yada, yada. The, the father ignored that. And instead, he looked at the beggar and said, hey, <laughs> I've messed up, I want to change. Help those people. Even God didn't help the man that beat on his chest. So why are you? Hmm. You, you who have allowed to let people's cries of selfishness get yours, you are in. Now, are you ready for this? I hope you are. You are in idolatry, worshiping another image. What do you mean, Mark? To worship is the Hebrew word prahusneo. It means to focus on something. You are so focused on someone else's problem, it's wearing you down, wearing you down. Do what God tells you to do, and if they just keep on draining you, then your witness has expired, and God will bring someone else in. Selfishness is simply this, self-idolatry. And so if they want to worship themselves, that's fine. But no one says you have to worship them. It'll, it'll save you a lot of heartache, heartbreak, resources. Just I speak on you wisdom to know when to turn from these people. Now what's this? What do I do, Mark? You minister and love them minister in love to them, it's okay to talk to them. It, it's okay. It's okay to say, no, I can't do that. Do you realize, do you hear me? I have come to the place in my life, it's okay to say no. It's so, see, I want to live balanced. I want to live selfless. I want to live selfish to the degree I take care of myself. I want my mind to be at peace. I want my body to be healthy. I want my spirit to be rejuvenated, revived, walking in love and joy and peace and meekness and kindness. But don't let that person's selfishness become your idol. How can you worship God and someone else's problems? You can't. So, 
you minister in love to them. And when I say minister, be present. Ministry is not just sharing scripture. Ministry is sometimes just being with a person. That's fine. Love them. But don't let their selfishness become your idol. Or, watch this. If you have let someone else's idol become what you worship, you're going to live in the same demise they are. They're bringing you down to their level. People that don't want to change, they are bringing you down to their level. Because see, well Mark, oh my God, have I entered idolatry of another person's lack? I've been worshiping their problem, I don't know three things you can check. Are you hurt? Because they don't appreciate what they do? Are you hurt? Because you know they belittle you and, and they'll just talk to you like a king one day and a pulper the next. They'll praise you one day and cuss you out the next. That can hurt you. Do you live frustrated? Are you frustrated when you see them, you see their phone calling, whatever? And do you feel like you can never do enough to satisfy them? Then you are in idolatry. But the good news is I set you free from it. Because today, some of you are going to start making some decisions that, hey, I love this person, I, I am concerned about them, but God, my witness has expired. I give you permission to bring someone else into their life that can impart what they need to hear and what they need to do. Turn from those people. Turn from those people. So I hope you guys are taking this in context. Don't, don't get off here saying Mark Shell don't believe in witnessing too long to somebody. No. Oh my God, I'm long suffering. But when a person will not receive the change the love was intended for, then I will not. There's my selfish side kicking in. I'm gonna take care of myself. I'm gonna keep myself at peace because if my mind is not at peace, my body is gonna show it. And many of you listening to this and watching it, you're sick because of someone else's personality. I will guarantee you. Stress has to do with 97% of all sickness and disease. How can you give hilariously and begrudgingly at the same time. It is impossible. So anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you guys for chiming in. Uh, let's see, next week, my friends in Texas, I will be at Pastor Jerry and uh, uh, Jerry Edmonds Church there in uh, Elgin, Texas, right there by Austin. And uh, I'll be down there next Sunday. And so thank you guys so much for your support of the ministry. This is how I do what I do. And other people's gonna hear what you heard today and even more things in a deeper manner, uh, a more broad manner. And so you are funding the ministry with your, with your resources. And I certainly thank you for that very, very much. Check out the website, markshellministries.com. If you have any questions, contact me, markshellministries at gmail.com. If you've never partnered with the ministry, you can do that online. And so I thank you again for everything you do. Keep the church family here in Waterbury in your thoughts and in your declarations. This house is gonna make it good. It's a good, strong church under great leadership, and I do appreciate your time of checking this out, and I would ask you,
to take care of yourself and others. Elijah brought balance to the widow woman. What's it gonna take to bring balance to you? You all have a blessed day. I will see you next Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Time. I'll be back in the middle.